the one thing I remember about the villages of Zambia is I never came to a village that wasn't prosperous. I never saw a hungry person. I never saw a person who seemed to me to be poor. Um, I saw plenty of people who didn't have any clothes. I saw hardly any people at all who had things like motor cars, motorcycles, radio sets and things like that. I didn't have one myself, any of those things. I never saw anybody hungry. I never heard of anybody being hungry. I never heard of anything like famines. I never heard of unemployment. The reason why there was no unemployment was there was no employment. Nobody was employed. Um, there were no jobs. Nobody wanted a job. What the devil do you want with a job if you've got everything you need? You've got your house. You, anyone uh, that I met could build his house in a, in a day with the help of his neighbors. They used to build the, the, the roof on the floor, on the ground. They'd build the roof. It was a conical roof like that, a perfect circle. Then they would build the walls, perfect circle. Then they'd pick the roof up and put it on top of the <laughs> walls. And in a day they would have a home. And I've lived in those homes and I can tell you they were damn comfortable. They were far more comfortable, in my opinion, than the, the rubbishy homes that we pinkies used to live in. For one thing, um, you went in them, there was a fire in the, in the middle of the floor and uh, it generated smoke and you went in and when you were standing up you were nearly choked but you found when you sat down the smoke was over your head, there was a ceiling of smoke and the mosquitoes didn't bother you. <laughs> and uh, they'd got it all worked out and it worked extremely well. Now I'm told, I went to Africa again after the war and I flew around in a flying machine and uh, I looked at all these places um, and I could see what seemed to me, okay, progress. Progress is a wonderful thing. But you see, you can progress in any direction. You can progress in the direction of better life for people or worse life for people. And I went to Lusaka and I could see people streaming into it, leaving their villages, leaving their land, uh, their little uh, bits of land that they had that, on which they could grow all the food they needed. The wild bees that nested in the trees, you could always get plenty of honey and you could brew the most excellent beer from it. Uh, they were swarming into Lusaka to, for the flesh pots, as they thought. And I don't know what Lusaka is like now because I haven't been there since 19... what was it? Just after the war anyway. Uh, but I read things in the papers. I read of people being hungry, people in the villages being hungry. They did, in the days that I'm talking about, they didn't need any aid from anybody. They would have despised aid. We used to turn up in these villages and I had uh, um, people carrying stuff and all the rest of it, and there'd be about 24, 25 of us. We'd turn up in the village, we would be welcome, there was always plenty of beer, the little <coughs> children looked healthy and fat and, and uh, beautiful, and um, there would be prosperity. I think the right kind of prosperity. I don't think the ownership of an enormous number of electronic gadgets from the other side of the world that um, can do all sorts of wonderful things, think for us and all the rest of it. I don't call this prosperity. I call it just befuddling our minds with a lot of unnecessary and irrelevant nonsense. Prosperity means a good house, waterproof, uh, mosquito resistant, um, plenty of food, plenty of beer, plenty of good drums to make good music, a good culture, a culture that is an ancient culture and has not been corrupted and disturbed and um, uh, ruined by uh, two rapid transitions to other cultures or the impact of other cultures from other parts of the world, which possibly are no better, no more, no more cultured, no, no more, uh, their traditions are no better than the, the traditions that they're, they're uh, having impact upon. And that is my, my d definition of prosperity. Uh, and I'd like to see Africa progress. I want to see it progress. I want to see it go uh, forward into the future. We mustn't turn the clock back. We're always being told. You can't turn the clock back. Well, of course you can. Anybody who's got a clock can turn it back if they want to. 
uh, we must have progress, we're told. Anything that we do to move into the future is progress. You can progress from horses to tractors. You can progress from tractors to horses. This is progress. Whichever side it is, it's progress. Progress simply means developing, moving into, into something else. That's all it means. We don't have to have any particular kind of progress. If it's not good for us, we don't have to have it. The sort of progress we need is progress towards um, uh, to, uh, happier, healthier, and more contented and integrated society. And this is the sort of progress I would like to see, not only in Africa, but in England. And I writ this thing here, and uh, I will start reading it, but it's very much about e England, I'm afraid, and not about Africa, but maybe there's certain relevances. I have to take my glasses off to read. Yes. Wait a minute. Um, and I won't read very much of it, because I shall very soon um, just tell you what I want to say, because I can probably tell you a lot more shortly than, I, than I've written it down here. Now, this is called King Midas and Merry England. I think that was your idea, wasn't it, John, the title? But it's <laughs> very good. <laughs> yes. Anyone who's been directly connected with the land for as long as I have discovers two things. Now, this applies to Africa and to the, the, the rest of the world as, it, as much as it does to, to England. One is the rock-like certainty of established agricultural practitioners that the way that they're farming now is the right way and the only way, and the way that farming is always going to be conducted to the end of the world. Only perhaps what they're, what they're doing, but even more so. Now, I went to an agricultural college when I was a young man in Kent, and uh, I was most impressed by the complete certainty of the people who taught us that what uh, was then considered to be the modern agricultural practices of England were the ones that were going to endure forever. There was no doubt England had reached the apotheosis of agricultural uh, practice and it could never change because that was it. You'd arrived there. All it could do was go on more like it is. If you ask an establishment farmer if things would ever change, his answer would be something like this. Well, they've changed a hell of a lot since my father's day, but they're not going to change direction anymore. Farming will progress, as it has all been doing for the last 50 years, towards more specialization, more mechanization, automation, robotization even, chemicalization, amalgamation, and more and more monoculture. And of course, the small farmer is doomed. Now, of course, all those things mechanization, automation, chemicalization, and all these things, they're all dependent on the oil wells. But this is rather a, a I suppose, a trivial um, uh, consideration. But they are all dependent on the oil wells. Somewhere down here, oh, they're here, I see it here now. I stood with a highly mechanized neighbor watching horses plowing at a plowing match. And he said to me, I suppose you'll think we'll come back to that when the oil runs out. And I said, I'm damn sure we will. And he said, I won't, because I'm going to give up ploughing and I'm going to use paraquat. Now, paraquat is a particularly filthy poison, which comes from the oil wells, which you spray on your land and it destroys everything. And then you can direct drill into your stubble and you get a crop, and probably quite a good crop. And so I said to him, where do you think paraquat comes from? Of course, he suddenly realized it comes from the oil wells, of course. And therefore, when the oil wells run dry, not only will he not be able to run his tractors, but he won't be able to shove his poison on his land because there won't be any. So farming is going to change. And not only that, but the whole direction it's going in is going to change too. And there's only one thing that we amateur futurologists can be sure of, and that it is that the future won't be anything like we think it's going to be. Agribusiness is already under heavy strain in the big agribusiness countries like this one. I know several large farmers who are getting very near to what I call the black hole situation. I know I have a friend in, in Sussex. <coughs> and, uh, I've known him for years and years and years. He's got 1,200 acres of very, very good land, wheat land, and he's also got some, some uh, um, down land on which he ha has sheep. And he's a good farmer, in uh, uh, my way of thinking, because he's got um, three herds of cows, he's got uh, animals on his land, he's got sheep, 
He's got a big herd of pigs. I hate the way he keeps them. He's got 600 cows on concrete all their lives, and um, I don't like the, the humanity of it, but the, the uh, farming of it, I think, is quite good, because at least he's putting some muck into his land. He's employing more people on that 1,200 acres than most agribusiness farmers. But he's getting near the black hole situation. He, 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 I think he employs 12 people now. The last time I was there, he had 12 people. Well, it's too much for 1,200 acres nowadays, we're told by our agricultural economists and uh, our agricultural advisors. It's just too much. He's got a sackum. He doesn't want a sackum because their, their fathers work for his father and all that stuff. Um, but he'll have to sack him because otherwise he'll go broke. He's constantly having to invest more and more money. He, he um, invested the, uh, the year before last in a huge um, range of uh, grain elevators. Um, to pay for this, he's just like a dog chasing his tail. To pay for this, he's, got a, he's in the three-ton club. He grows three tons of wheat per acre now. He does this with enormous inputs of chemicals, enormous. He admits it himself. Uh, nitrogen, I think, is something like four tons to the acre of 20% uh, nitrogen he puts on. Um, he runs out every morning when his wheat is growing with a big magnifying glass, poking around looking for little bugs or, or some new disease. And they have diseases now that I never heard of when I was at agricultural college. You couldn't possibly learn the names of them all. And then he has to rush back and get on the phone and order some more spray. And every one of the sprays he puts on costs more than the land was worth in his father's day. And um, last year, I know he put, because I asked him, he put on eight sprays on his wheat during the, the, the growth of the crop. There were eight sprays put on it. All poisons, fungicides, insecticides, bactericides, herbicides. You see, he's got no men to hoe, so he can't, he's got to use herbicides to, to kill, uh, eliminate weed competition. Uh, he's, he hasn't got enough animals, although he's got more than most people, therefore he has to buy these enormous quantities of um, fertilizer to put on his land. And uh, because it's monoculture, it's white straw, wheat and barley, nothing else, he has enormous inputs of, um, of these bactericides and things like that, because monoculture invites disease, always. If you get enough of one species together and you, year after year you grow the same species, the pests and diseases of that species will proliferate and they do so on his farm like they do on all the agribusiness farms. Now this is fine and it can go on and after all his father um, uh, only used to grow two tons of wheat to the acre. This man grows three. But the inputs that his father used to put in per acre were, you can probably say, nil. He probably put some basic slag on occasionally to shove a bit of phosphate on. He may have got some chili and nitrate because it was all the rage in those days. Um, but his inputs of uh, nitrogen, phosphate and potash were practically nil. And his inputs of sprays were nil because the damn things hadn't been invented in those days. When I started farming in Essex or working on farms in Essex when I was a boy, None of these things, not one of them, had been invented. There were no sprays used on the land in those days. Um, now, right, we've, we're, we're growing, uh, the best farmers are growing three tons of wheat to the acre. In those days, the best farmers were growing two tons. The average uh, in uh, Britain now is under two tons to the acre. So, if you take the, the country as a whole, we're not so much better off in yield per acre than we were then. But if you take input into consideration, we are abominably badly off. Nearly all these fertilizers come from outside this country. The nitrogen all comes at the moment from the natural gas wells, and they're fizzling out. And very soon the North Sea will fizzle out with, it, with its oil as well. And what is going to happen then? Now, I don't want to see the, the countries of what are called the third world, I don't know why, I think it's the first world myself. I don't want to see them going down this road because it's the wrong road. I believe it's the wrong road. I believe it's the road that leads to famine, to starvation, to terrible balance of payments problems, to borrowing money from all sorts of people, and to becoming hooked on this disgusting thing which is called 
aid, food aid. Uh, the Africans before the war, they, they did not need food aid. They could grow their own food. They knew how to do it. We couldn't teach them how to do it. They could have taught us an awful lot. They did it. And if they didn't do it, then they starved to death. And I never heard of any of them starving to death. Maybe they did up around the Sahara or somewhere like that. I don't know. But during the war, I went all through Ethiopia and Kenya and what's it called, Tanzania and uh, all those countries. And up to the war, people were prosperous and they had enough food. They didn't have a whole lot of junk. Japanese junk and English junk and German junk and American junk. They didn't need it. They had enough food and they had their own culture. It was a damn good culture. Now every culture in the world can benefit by, by contact with, with other cultures. And I'm not saying that they should be insular and, and uh, 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 not uh, go and find out what's happening in the rest of the world. I wouldn't say that at all. What I am saying is I don't want to see them going down that road of mechanization, chemicalization, hooking themselves on chemicals that any fool can see are going to be finished in 10, 20, 30, 40 years' time. What the devil is the good of inventing a kind of agriculture that is entirely dependent on soluble nitrogen when you know perfectly well that your sources of it uh, will, will have, have dried up in, in 40 years' time. When you can grow perfectly good food and enough of it with good old muck that comes out of cows and sheep and things like that, and us for that matter. What is the good of it? And of course, farmers have got to do what they've got to do. The economic circumstances of the time forced them to do this and to do that. Like my friend in, in Sussex. Uh, he doesn't like what he's doing. He knows it's wrong. He's like the old whore. He knows it's wrong, but he can't give it up because he's always trying to pay the bank, um, what is it, 15% interest or something like that, on the, the last great big dollop of money that he borrowed in order, like the Argentine, in order to pay the one before that off. So he's like a dog chasing his tail. He uh, lives in a very lavish way. You'd think he's a very wealthy man, but if you look at his books, he's, a, he's worried stiff, and he can't get out of it. There's no way he can get out of it. Now, the English have, the English farmers, some of them, thank God, haven't gone down that road. But the ones that have, they're learning that lesson. They're learning what the word of the, what the meaning of the word black hole is. Um, and they know perfectly well now that the price of nitrogen has trebled in the last four years, I think I'm right in saying. And this has completely altered the whole economics of the thing. But they're hooked on it. There is no way they can't go back to yarding cattle and uh, folding sheep and things like that. Where would they get the men to, to, to look after them? The men have all been kicked out. I'm sorry, I, should, I, should, I, f I forgot. They've been made redundant. They've been kicked out. They've gone to the cities and they're standing in the dole queues. And uh, two-thirds of the farmers have been kicked out too. Uh, the amalgamation, the government used to give amalgamation grants, the EEC now, that abomination is still giving amalgamation grants, bribing small farmers to go and join the dole queues in the cities uh, so that uh, their farms can be amalgamated with Mr. Big next door. Um, I just don't see the sense of it, and I don't see the, any future in it, and I don't think this is the way in which progress lies. I don't think uh, when I talk like this, um, agribusinessmen always say to me, ah, you're against progress. How can anybody be against progress? Progress goes on all the time. I'm against the wrong sort of progress. I'm against progress to, uh, to more and more dependency on things from outside our countries, uh, on high finance, on uh, reliance, on credit, on getting into debt, when we don't need to. We don't need to in this country, we don't need to in Wales, which I know very well, in Ireland where I live now, we don't need to. And you don't need to, sir, in Kenya or in any part of Africa. You can be, you can be self-sufficient and uh, dependent on yourselves. And as for aid, this food aid that uh, the Americans and other people dump into these countries, it can do nothing but, uh, but harm. It is corrupting. It, it takes people off their shambas, off their 
their little farms and it draws them away from their villages. In India I've seen the same thing. It draws people away from their villages and from their farms to go to Calcutta and Bombay where the damn stuff is dumped and so they become dependent on it there and it's a one-way ticket to the city. You don't go back. There's no return ticket. I met an old man in Switzerland uh, last year and uh, we were talking about this very thing with the, the, the peasants of the mountains. And uh, he said to me, a peasant, a mountain peasant is like a rock. It's easy for him to go downhill. It's very difficult to get him to go up again. And I think this, is a, this applies in Africa, in India, in England, in uh, probably the United States. Uh, in fact, in every country in the world. In the end, the only people who matter a damn are the peasants, the people who grow the food. The rest of us, we're all flowers, beautiful flowers, but we've got nothing to do with the roots and the leaves, the, 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 the photosynthesis part of it. Where I don't like to use the word, and I'm not going to use it, because probably you can all imagine what the word that I wanted to use was. But the only person who is an honest person in the world is the man who grows food. And we are destroying them. All over the world we're destroying them. We're luring them into the cities. In Ireland, where I live now, they, they, the, the government, the policy of the government has been to eliminate the small farmer, eliminate the peasant, uh, amalgamate the farms, bigger and bigger and bigger. Get more and more Japanese and English and West German and American investment to, to start making a whole lot of stupid little electronic gadgets which are worth nothing to anybody, they're useless. And then with the money that they think they, they thought they were going to make from this, then Ireland can buy its food. Ireland is now importing potatoes for God's sake and bacon. And, of course, the Japanese firms and the English firms and all the rest, they're going bust. And every, you never open a paper over there that you don't see more bankruptcies, more, more, more um, factories being closed down. Uh, the, the unemployment is, is astronomical there. Now they're beginning to think maybe they did wrong in taking two-thirds of the agricultural population and, uh, and dragging them into the cities. Ah, but they can't get them back again. They don't want to go. They go on the dole. They're all going on the dole now. And uh, uh, the Irish government is finding it a little bit difficult to pay the dole. And maybe the time will come when it won't be able to pay it. And then what's going to happen? I suppose in the end they'll have to go back. They'll have to go back or starve. And that will be progress. When they go back, that'll be progress. When the millions of people in Lusaka go back again to the villages and insist on their birthright, and their birthright is, is their own piece of land. When that happens, that will be progress of the right kind. And um, that's really, I think, all I've got to say. Thank you.